Hey, everyone. All right, so last speaker before lunch, right? Some of your stomachs are already grumbling. So is mine, but my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. I don't know what your food is, but I'll be fine up here. So, uh, well, this is a lot of fun. I'm glad to be back. This is, uh, I've been here a few times now, and, and it's always a highlight of the year for me. Um, a little background on me, did a PhD in linguistics, um, got to live overseas for about six years, got involved in a Bible translation project, um, and then started a company devoted to collecting data for low resource languages and got involved with um, the amazing innovation lab with every tribe, every nation. And I know there's a lot of us here. Um, there's a lot to, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great community of, of practitioners that has, has been experimenting now for a couple of years and are really pushing things forward. So it's a, it's a delight to be part of that group and um, I'm going to share some of the results of what we've been working on. So addressing data scarcity for long-tail languages. All right, so the dream is this. We are all hearing all the conversations about AI. Here's a quote by Saul Khan from Khan Academy to the New York Times. He says, we're at the cusp of using AI for probably the biggest positive transformation that education has ever seen. And the way we're going to do that is by giving every student on the planet an artificially intelligent but amazing personal tutor, right? We've, we've all seen quotes like these where the promise of AI is that everyone on the planet gets their own AI tutor or uh, their own AI doctor. But there is one small problem. The language of three billion individuals is not yet supported online. Now, some of you may have an issue with that statistic and say, yeah, but these are multilingual people. That means, yeah, their mother tongue's not supported online, but many of these people speak other languages that are supported. Well, there's another little important fact here. This just came out a couple of months ago from Amazon. You can scan the QR code and actually get access to this paper. But they did this thorough study that demonstrated that a large amount of the web is actually machine translated. And so that means if you're paying attention to the performance of a lot of large language models and machine translation systems, those companies that are depending on scraped data what they're actually scraping is decades of machine translated content that was done by really bad translation models, right? So these are Google Translate from years ago or some other translation model from years ago that was out there that an ad agency, some marketing groups promised we're gonna boost your signal into over 100 languages. Somebody paid them and they translated this material and that's what's populating the web. So a lot of the, a lot of the data on the internet is actually polluted for these long tail languages. So scraping is not the solution. Compute will not solve this problem. Many of us have heard that the, the only moats in AI are data, distribution, and compute. Well, compute will not solve this problem for us. In order to get these languages supported for artificial intelligence, we have to do collection. We have to solve collecting pristine data. Where do I point? There we go. All right, so last year I, I got to give a talk and I talked about the challenges and the opportunities for collecting data for long tail languages or low resource languages. And I just put it out there. I said, okay, a lot of people working in AI are doing what's called the robot weight loss program, right? The robot weight loss program is basically how do we get AI to work better with less data, right? And a lot of people are working on that problem. I said, well, what if we go the other direction and meet them in the middle? What if we just solve data scarcity in general? What would it take to actually solve data scarcity? It's challenging though, because low resource languages, many of them lack standardization, okay? They, they're, they're, there's not an established way of spelling things. Um, there's multiple dialects. Oftentimes, every village gets its own dialect. Many of these communities are oral only, so depending on text is not the, the solution. And then motivation, how to get people to con you know, contribute data. How do you get them to actually give us the data that we need? These are all challenges that we've had direct experience with at my company, XRI Global, and um, uh, this, is, this is our sweet spot. These are the kinds of challenges that, that we like to overcome. So how do we solve it? Well, we solve that algorithm right there. I really just put that up there to make it look like we're smart. But um, so the formula is this. How do we maximize intelligence per utterance 
and reduce the cost per utterance so we can collect what we need as fast and as cheap as possible. Now, my wife is trying to solve that algorithm as well for me, right? How do we maximize the intelligence per utterance, right? And so probably very similar for many of you in this room as well. But so how do we, how do, we do this? If we're going to go out and we're going to collect something, how do we know it's the right something, okay? I'll figure out where to point it, I promise. There we go. So how do we do this? Well, language is composable. So what is speech? Speech is continuous acoustic signal that's decomposable into phonemes. Writing is symbols reflecting phones combined to form rule-based roots and morphology, which form the core of semantics combined in a semi-rule-based syntax combined to form higher level discourse pragmatic structures, which are situated in domains. Now, the linguists in the room just say, right now, I feel seen, right? I feel seen, I feel heard. The rest of you, I'll give you some time to work through that. But the domain, the, the, it's all situated in domains, right? It comes from semantic field theory, the view that vocabulary of language is a system of interrelated lexical networks and not an inventory of independent items. What that means is if right now I injected in this talk the statement, the most reliable stable coin in our modern financial system is the Sam's Club hot dog. If I said that right now, it's completely out of domain, right? It is not connected at all to the topic of this conversation, to this entire conference or whatever, but you wouldn't expect that. So if we trained a neural net, we were doing data collection for this conference, that sentence would probably not make it in our data collection, right? Because when we're collecting data, we, we, we need to take into account that when we are talking about certain things, we are in specific domains of conversation. So this means that if we know the kind of stuff we want to translate, we can reduce the semantic fields we collect for, right? If we know exactly what we want to translate, we can get close to guaranteeing 100% coverage of the semantic and grammatical features we need to collect. So this should inform, if we know what we want to translate or the kinds of things we want to translate, it should take this, this semantic field theory into account that we don't need to talk about everything, right? So how do, we, how, how do we chase this down? Maximum intelligence per utterance, reducing the cost um, per utterance so that we can collect exact only what we need. We can collect completely and only what we need. All right, so how do we do this? Here's some experimenting that we've done. One experiment is harvesting data from existing resources via AI agents. We had a lot of experimentation in this place. There are a lot of grammars of low resource languages that for decades have been published by linguists and by groups like SIL, right, who are out there and they have been writing and documenting in great detail how these languages work. Well, we did some experimentation and we took an AI agent and chained together about 20 something prompts to get it to actually parse out and understand specifically how that language works based on the resource itself. And then based on that knowledge, we gave it sentences to translate and, and said, can we actually generate into the low resource language based on a thorough description of the grammar? Now, the first result we got, let's see, we were trying to do a back translation into English from this low resource languages in the Caucasus Mountains. We were just trying to translate the sentence, the children love ice cream, all right? That was the English sentence. And so our first attempt, the results came back, um, your tongue with the spine of a bull will watch them on Friday. So I'd say we were not close at all, right, in that experiment. But things got better, right, and we got to the point where we were actually getting somewhat, um, somewhat consistent results, although the cost per sentence was roughly about $2, right, to produce a single sentence, and it was taking roughly about four to five minutes to do. So we've got some more experimentation to do there, um, but that was one experiment. The other experiment that we've been running is collecting pristine data from native speakers themselves. They're talking every day. How do we just get in front of them and get them to give us the sentences, right? So that's, that's the other way to do this. And so <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit more about this second experiment that we've done. Okay, so what we did is we've come up with a, a pretty neat and unique algorithm um, that we can apply to any body of text, but what we've done in this case, working with Every Tribe, Every Nation and SIL, is we've applied it to a corpus of scripture that is designed to extract the unique senses and grammatical features um, that are in that unique corpus. 
Then we've generated natural, easy to translate sentences, including all the necessary features using an LLM. We've added in a bit of redundancy to make sure that the model that we're training has seen enough examples, right? Hired native speakers who are translators that contribute via our mobile app that we give them. And then we fine tune a neural machine translation or system or an LLM on this data set. So this is um, the approach that we've taken. And uh, it's just a, a really blurry screenshot of our mobile app called EchoNet, right? We have multiple tasks in the app, simple translation tasks, as well as vocabulary matching tasks and a lot of a uh, handful of other features that we've built into the app. It's available in the Android store, the Apple store, as well as a mobile app. Um, it's localized into as many languages as we need to. Um, and what's the result? So the corpus that we did was uh, if we just wanted the Gospels in Genesis, if we could train a system just to translate well the Gospels and Genesis, what, our, what we were able to demonstrate was we really only need about 8,000 sentences. And in four weeks, we collected, that was the best case scenario, uh, we collected um, the source and target pairing. Uh, six weeks was about the worst case scenario, and we got these scores. Now, if these don't make much sense to you, that's okay. Um, but essentially what it tells you is it is roughly a uh, mediocre Google Translate um, type of performance. And it did vary by language. Every language didn't give us the same um, scoring, and, and we're continuing to work on the, the training methods as well as the algorithm for collection. Now, the more important, um, oh, this is uh, an example. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and paste in Genesis 1.1 into an app. This is uh, uh, in Indonesian right now, translating into a low-resource bible language in Indonesia. Right? It's calling the model right now. There's three different options, right? three different calls to the model. They would select the best one, and then they can type, and they can edit, um, and then they submit, right? and then... Basically, this was, uh, this was just a very simple, you know, AI helped me put this together in like less than an hour, just a simple front end as a way to actually call the model and um, uh, get native speakers to experience the actual translation model that we built. Um, and so the, what, what the, the, and then we, had, we asked them to fill out a form. This is, this is the more exciting uh, statistic for us. Here, So this is an Indonesian, um, and you're just going to have to believe me, unless you speak Indonesian, that we asked them um, to talk about the quality of the translation model. Like, the tool is a throwaway tool. That's not what we were trying to get them to validate. It's just the model itself. How well does this actually speak your language after four weeks and 8,000 sentences? And uh, eight out of nine responded that this is both natural and accurate. Right? And so this was a very, very exciting thing to see. One of, the, uh, one of the, the native speakers said, it's natural, but it's not accurate. All right? And so this was the feedback that we got. Um, another question that we asked was, um, will this accelerate translation for you? Right? This is a team that is going to be doing Bible translation. And if they had an AI co-pilot um, you know, uh, that was based on this model, would it actually accelerate translation for them, or would it slow them down? Would it annoy them? Is it useless? Uh, you want us to go away? Like, those are the kinds of questions we asked, right? And so, the, once again, eight out of nine said, this will definitely accelerate um, translation for us. And um, the, the, that one person said, maybe a little bit. So, um, that's, those, are the, those are the exciting results that, that we got from this experience. So, what's next? Uh, we're... We're planning to get 20 languages started by summer. We're hoping to do more. If you guys have projects that you would like us to do data collection on, please see me. Let's talk. Our aim is to get as many of these languages supported as fast as possible because I think we've now demonstrated a methodology that can scale. And so we, we hope that we can support many of your projects and opportunities. But it's also laying the foundation for future possibilities. Once these models are developed, they can be reused for Bible-related resources, right? So a lot of these communities around the world, um, there's, there's more than just the Bible that is valuable and, and, and relevant to them. And so we're interested in reusing these for Bible-related resources, updating older translations. Many of you who are in Bible translation know that there's a problem of, of modern Bible translations, right? There's a lot of translations that need to be redone. This methodology um, is easily, easily replicable replicable for that use case, right? We're collecting modern 
uh, language data, right, so that we can produce more contemporary translations and learn from the, the older translations as well. And then we are uh, working to find the fastest and cheapest path to speech models for oral communities. A lot of these long tail communities would rather interact in an oral way, right, and so the similar methodologies could be applied to finding what is the fastest and cheapest method to getting speech recognition and text-to-speech models that, um, that support um, the interaction of these, these low-resource, long-tail communities with artificial intelligence with voice. And so this is something that we're excited to engage. And that, I give you four minutes back to get you to lunch early. So thank you guys so much. Uh, happy to talk with you afterwards. Thanks.